Good evening. Good evening. Welcome back. And thank you for your flexibility as we rescheduled this program. And we're delighted to see you all here. Thank you for coming. This caps off what I think has been a phenomenal year for the Friends of the LBJ Library. Thanks to you for making it a great year. We featured everything this year from uh, the premiere of Hulu's new drama series, The Looming Tower, based on Lawrence Wright's award-winning book. Uh, we had Jake Tapper from CNN here, uh, a look back at the pivotal year 1968 with Bill Moyers, Tom Johnson, Linda Johnson, Rob, and uh, the person who would become the new director of the LBJ Library, Kyle Longley. We had Olympic fencer Iptahaj Muhammad, best-selling author and historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, former CIA director John Brennan, and almost uh, former California governor Jerry Brown. And we cap off the year with the incomparable Michael Beschloss, who will talk about his book, Presidents of War. If you are not a Friends member, we would love to have you join our ranks. We've, um, just as we had a great lineup this year, we're working on a great lineup for 2019. And I can tell you that sometimes uh, it's hard for us to know in advance who's going to be here. We're very opportunistic uh, and we try to get folks to come, but sometimes it's last minute. So we can't always know who's going to be here, but, but I can promise you that we're working on some very big names who will be worth your time. Among others, next year we have coming uh, Darren Walker, the uh, president of the Ford Foundation, who will be here with Nancy Keene, a professor from the Harvard Business School, and they'll talk about character in leadership. We also will have the preview of a new PBS documentary on going to the moon, the space race of the 1960s. That'll be in May, so there's some wonderful things afoot for next year. I, I wanna thank our sponsors, as always, for helping to make our, our year terrific, and, and they include St. David's Healthcare, the Moody Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and Tito's Handmade Vodka. <laughs> you guys love the vodka. <laughs> um, Introducing our special guest tonight is the chairman of the LBJ Foundation, Larry Temple. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Larry Temple. Before introducing our guest tonight, I want to acknowledge the passing and pay tribute to President George H.W. Bush. There always was a personal friendship as well as mutual respect between George H.W. and Barbara Bush on the one hand and Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson on the other hand. Over the strong opposition of his own party in Texas, Congressman George H.W. Bush courageously voted for LBJ's Fair Housing Act in 1968, the last critical part of President Johnson's civil rights legislation. When asked why he cast that controversial vote, Congressman Bush said, well, it was just the right thing to do. When Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson left Washington to return to Texas on January 20, 1969, just a few hours after the inauguration of President Nixon, every Republican except one was downtown celebrating the new president. The one exception was Congressman George H.W. Bush, who was at Andrews Air Force Base, saying goodbye to the Johnsons. You'll see a photograph of that goodbye being shown on the wall behind me. When asked why he had come to Andrews instead of attending the inaugural parade for Richard Nixon, Congressman Bush said, well, he's my friend and my president, and he's leaving town. I didn't want him to leave town without my being here and paying my respect to him. Now how is that for grace, civility, decency, and friendship? <clears throat> the highest award that the LBJ Foundation gives is its Liberty and Justice for All Award, 
we give it to individuals who in their own time and in their own way have carried on the legacy of Lyndon Johnson to open the doors of opportunity for all of our citizens to enjoy the privileges and protections that this great country offers. In 2013, we gave that award to President George H.W. Bush in recognition, at least in part, uh, for his leadership in the passage of the Americans with Disability Act. I think you're viewing there on the wall behind me a photograph of that award that was presented to President Bush. To recognize a meaningful, impactful, and truly remarkable life, I want to ask for a round of applause to pay tribute to President George H.W. Bush. Thank you. Now, on to tonight's program. Michael Besloss has been proclaimed by Newsweek as, quote, the nation's leading presidential historian, close quote, and it would be hard to find anyone who disagrees. He has written 10 books on American presidents. He is NBC News presidential historian and is frequently seen on PBS and other channels. The number of presidents about whom Michael has researched and written puts a reader in awe. In just one book, Presidential Courage, Michael Beschloss provides expert and unique insights on the lives and legacies, listen to this, George Washington, John Adams, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan. In his latest and current book, Presidents of War, and he'll talk about that tonight, Michael chronicles the wartime roles of Presidents Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Polk, Abraham Lincoln, William McKinley, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. Michael Beschloss invested 10 years to complete his research and writing of this compelling book. He's also written other books about Presidents Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and John Kennedy. Now just think for a minute what Michael Beschloss has done. We've had 45 presidents in the history of this country. Michael Beschloss has written books on 19 of those presidents, almost half of the total presidents. He's written public articles on even more. At this library, we are particularly captivated by his two books on the LBJ telephone tapes. Taking Charge covers the period from 1963 through the election of 1964. Reaching for Glory covers the last part of 1964 and all of 1965. If you've not read those books, I, I would encourage you to do so because Michael Beschloss uses President Johnson's own conversations to tell the story of those periods in a very compelling way. All I can say about Michael Beschloss is what a historian, what a writer. He has no peer on the public stage today. Moreover, as I've known him for over 30 years and I can say without a doubt, in addition to being a man of prolific accomplishment, he has no ego. He is, mod is a modest man. What you think you see on television is what he really is. He's a great man, but he's also a good man, and that combination doesn't always go together. Michael Beschloss gives us valuable and beneficial counsel here at the library on all occasions. He gave us great help when we renovated the exhibit a few years ago. So it's a treat to welcome him back to the stage tonight. So please welcome our guest star, Michael Beschloss, and Mark Updegrove, who will conduct the conversation with him tonight. Michael. Well, Michael, welcome back. Uh, thank you. After hearing what Larry said, I should probably leave now because <laughs> your opinion of me is only going to go down the more I speak. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. And uh, 
especially since we had to redo the night. Thank you, especially. Well, we had to redo the night, of course, because of the, the passing of George H.W. Bush, who, who Larry just paid tribute to. I thought, well, why don't we start off, well, just how, how should we remember? Michael uh, uh, covered the funerals of uh, President Bush in Washington and, and in Houston for NBC. How should we remember George Bush? Well, I think it's a really good example of, I think you'd agree with this, about everyone able to hear, by the way, in the back, in the very back. Oh, I see a couple of hands. Uh, I, I, I can't improve the content, but at least I can improve the volume if, <laughs> if, if it's necessary from me. Uh, I think it's a very good example of the way that history is supposed to work because you know, Mark and I will always say that presidents do not look the same way 30 years or more after they serve as they do at the time while they're sitting in the White House. And I think George H.W. Bush is a great example of that because anyone here who can remember 1993 when he left the White House, uh, there were a lot of people writing, he must not have been a very good president because he couldn't even manage to get reelected. This is not me talking, this is you know, journalists and others at the time, or mismanaged the economy, or yes, he helped to end the Cold War, but who cares about that anymore? Uh, you know, this is what really was said at the time. And here we are 25 years later, and because of some information that's come out since 1993, but more importantly, because of the passage of time, we see him in a very different way. Above all, in my view, that this was the guy who not only presided over the Cold War, but helped it to end in a way that any other president from Harry Truman on would have only dreamt of. Mm -hmm. uh, they never dreamt that it would end so quickly and without firing a shot. And without George Bush's enormous ability to build relationships of trust, as he did with Mikhail Gorbachev, that might not have happened if almost anyone else had been president. And, and Larry mentioned your humility, um, but, but George Herbert Walker Bush's humility really came into play in the peaceful resolution to the Cold War. Talk, sure. talk about that. Because, uh, and Larry was nice enough to mention all the, these books I wrote. I actually wrote a book with Strobe Talbot on the end of the Cold War, and we interviewed a lot of the Bush people and some of those around Gorbachev in the early 90s, and had almost anyone else been president, they would have given in to the advice of White House aides who said, you know, they just opened the Berlin Wall, or Eastern Europe has fled the Soviet Union, or Germany has reunified within NATO, the president should take a victory lap, maybe go to the Berlin Wall and say this is a triumph for the United States, Bush diplomatically knew that that would scare Gorbachev away from making any other concessions, and also it just was not in his nature to crow. Right. It, it amazes me, Michael, that, that when he left the White House in 1993, he lamented that Americans didn't know his heartbeat. Right. And when we celebrated his life last week, it was really all about heartbeat. Uh, and I think almost more than any single accomplishment of his presidency, he will be remembered for his character. Yeah, I think he will be remembered for his character at a time that presidential character was sort of taken for granted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but nowadays, you know, you will now look at Bush and see him as someone that you want your children to emulate. Right. Uh, and that's one thing. And, but the other thing that just drives you crazy is that you're right, he didn't have the ability to tout his own accomplishments. Had he been a little bit better than that, at that, for instance, in 1992, when he was running, he might have explained that, yes, we've been through a recession, but the economy is getting better. Uh, and oddly enough, his virtue was also his flaw, which was because he was modest and because, I'm sure you heard this at least 90 times during the coverage of you know, George Bush during this week, his mother always told him, don't talk about yourself. And so as a result, it was extremely hard for him to, during a campaign, talk about the accomplishments that really did deserve to be right. praised. 
And you write an awful lot about presidential character in presidents of war, and we'll talk about that. But I, we've been trying to get you here for a good long time because a lot of us have been anticipating this book. You have a lot, many fans, yeah, well, as you can see here in this. So uh, this was a decade in the making. Right, you, you all took a real risk inviting me here. <laughs> I mean, I spent 10 years writing this 750-page book. Uh, <laughs> Who knows how long I might speak tonight. Uh, you, know, you may be here at 2 a.m. and I'll still be going. I, I promise not. Uh, said all I had to say in the book, so. Uh. If, if it's a filibuster, we have, we have, we're going to invoke cloture. Uh, no, I, I, in fact, can, before we go on, can I tell one more Bush story, Bobby? which I think people don't know? Barbara Bush once told me, uh, those of you who know the last full day before Lyndon Johnson became president was November 21st, 1963. And President Kennedy and President Johnson were together in Texas. They were in San Antonio first, and then they flew to Houston, uh, and they went to the Rice Hotel. They spoke at a, President Kennedy spoke at a testimonial dinner. But Barbara Bush told me that when JFK and Jackie and the Johnsons came from the airport to Houston to the Rice Hotel. She was there in the, cr in the crowd cheering. And it tells you so much about how things have changed mm. because not only was she a Republican, she was you know, no Kennedy supporter particularly, although you know, she liked them personally. But this was November of 63. Her husband George was going to run for the Senate in Texas as a Republican in 1964 against Ralph Yarborough. Right. So if you can just think how different things were in those days, she didn't do it because she was going to be photographed, because I don't think she was. And I actually, after she told me that, I looked to see if there was any historical reference to that, and I wasn't able to find one. But the wife of the Republican candidate going to cheer the Democratic president who was running for right. re-election, and as she told me, she said, it's just the way things were done in those days how different we have become, and I really hope that those days come back again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the detour. Not at all. Um, so Michael, what, what, what made you want to write Presidents of War? Well, it's about, the book is about eight or nine presidents who uh, waged major wars in American history, and I was really curious, and this is for years before I actually came to write it, what did they have in common? Because they had this one experience that no one else has ever had, which is to send large Amer numbers of Americans into harm's way in a major war. And it turned out there were a number of things they had in common. One was every single one of them became more religious. Mm. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who those here who knew him, Larry, and a few others, I think you would probably agree with me that he was disciples of Christ. He certainly went to church. He didn't talk about it as a large force in his life. But I remember talking to Lady Bird Johnson late in her life, and she said that during the late years of the Vietnam War, LBJ was so tortured by the experience that he found comfort in religion. She thought for the first time in a really notable way. And she, he went with Lucy to the Catholic church that she went to in Southwest Washington. And Mrs. Johnson said, uh, during those days, it would not have surprised me a bit if Lyndon had become a Catholic. Because this person who she saw as someone who would, did not have deep spiritual belief, she felt, suddenly felt that having this experience of waging a war with major casualties and trauma and all the division in this country that we know that there was, this was something that he looked, looked to to comfort himself. Abraham Lincoln, when he was a young man, was thought of as a scoffer at religion, perhaps an agnostic, some thought an atheist. And when he was a war president late in the Civil War, a friend from Illinois came and found him reading the Bible and was astounded, and Lincoln said, I can't imagine that any president would go through this horrible experience without finding some comfort in religion. So they become more religious. 
uh, they all have empathy. Anyone who listens to those tapes of LBJ waiting for a plane to return from North Vietnam mm -hmm. from a bombing run know the kind of empathy he had that as the war went on and as the ca casualties rose, uh, it was such torture for him. Abraham Lincoln never wanted to get too distant from the deaths of the soldiers. Same thing with LBJ. In Lincoln's case, there were so many people getting killed that Lincoln's people came to him and said, we've got to build a new national cemetery. Where do you want it? And Lincoln said, build it near my summer home because I want all the time to see those Union graves being dug. It's going to be intensely painful to me, but I want to see the consequences of these terrible decisions that I'm making. He said to another friend, can you imagine that I, who cannot stand to watch a chicken being slaughtered, I'm responsible for generating oceans of blood. Mm -hmm. So empathy is another thing they had in common. Another thing is that every single one of them was married to a strong woman mm -hmm. who made the difference. Someday I hope to come back and talk about a president who was married to a strong man who made all the difference, maybe someday. Uh, may, may, maybe not a war president, but a president of some kind. But anyone who thinks that L Lady Bird Johnson did not have a lot to do with Lyndon Johnson's mm. leadership in the 1960s has a very big misapprehension. She used to talk about these years. She once said to me, First two years of Lyndon's presidency were wine and roses, and the rest of those years were pure hell mm -hmm. because of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. She talked of being on a train between New York and Washington and seeing another train going by, and she saw it was carrying cargo, and then with a shudder she realized it was coffins right. of young men coming back from Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, late, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, 1942, after Pearl Harbor, a lot of people were saying to FDR, for security reasons, you've got to send the Japanese Americans to internment camps. And she said, absolutely not. And then one day he did it. And she was so angry that some of the people who knew her felt that the marriage never quite, quite was the same after that. Mm -hmm. And you will know that much of World War II, she kept her distance from him, even though he was very lonely and asking her to spend more time at home. So those are the few of the, a few of the things that they had biographically in common. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that 200 years, that was a time where at the beginning, founders wrote the Constitution and they wanted wars to be declared by Congress. Still is in the Constitution last I checked. But over 200 years and the experience of all these eight or nine presidents, it now has come to, the, to be the case that any president can get us involved in a major war almost single-handedly, almost overnight. Last time Congress declared a war, anyone know or want to raise a hand? What year? May, may, I, let me, let me, may I read your, let, this is from the preface. Okay, uh, this, I'll just, not, not to preserve the suspense, 1942. Right, this is. A couple of wars since then. So you, and you reveal that answer in the preface. Let me, let me read what Michael has written uh, as a predicate to the book. I hope you don't find that I got the date wrong, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, you passed. All right, all right. Uh, with the two like when Ronald Reagan's uh, autobiography came out, do you think maybe he wrote three words of it? <laughs> so he went to the publisher, there were salespeople there, and he held it up for photographers and said, I hear it's a great book, I might even read it sometime. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I did write this one. And among the things you wrote includes this passage from the preface. With the too frequent acquiescence of Congress, chief executives have seized for themselves the power to launch large conflicts almost on their own authority. It is telling that the last time a president asked Congress to declare war was 1942. Were the founders to come back, they would probably be astonished and chagrined to discover that in spite of their ardent strivings, the life or death of much of the human race has now come to depend on the character of the single person who happens to be the President of the United States. And what- Do, do, do you want to write that again? Read that again? <laughs> Have a nice evening, everyone. <laughs>
But that, what, what, what becomes very clear is the executive branch throughout the course of our history gets stronger and stronger, and with it, the, the power of the President of the United States. And Congress seems to willingly uh, capitulate, willingly cede power sure. to the President. How has that happened? Why has that happened? Well, one reason is going all the way back to James Madison, presidents had a habit of saying, you criticize my war leadership, you're criticizing the soldiers in battle. And that's a pretty big restraint on members of Congress. You know, they don't want to seem to be criticizing soldiers. Uh, and the other thing is that when we are at war in general, there is a feeling that to criticize the president you know, may in some ways restrain the, constrain the war effort. And I think it's exactly the opposite because the founders of this country, they wanted us to criticize. Criticism and protest, to my mind, are the highest forms of patriotism. Right. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin said, our critic is our friend. Uh, and the reason was because no one criticized the British king. And, they, and our founders wanted to create a country that was different from that. The whole idea was that if you had a president, if you had members of Congress, we would all be criticizing them all the time. That would make them better presidents and better members of Congress. And so you know, that you're expressing yourself as a, as a citizen that way. Uh, so for congressional leaders to restrain themselves especially in wartime, is not a great thing. And I should say, if I were a president, I would hate to be criticized. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to be criticized by my congressional leaders. I would hate to be criticized by the press, but it's part of what makes us great as a system. So is the weakening of Congress irrevocable, or do you envision a time when Congress becomes more robust, becomes more uh, I think they have to become more robust. Uh, and it goes back, I mean, it really goes back, uh, this book starts with James Madison, but second president I deal with is James Polk, who has a little Texas history. Uh, and Polk in the, the late 1840s, he wanted a war with Mexico, you all know. Uh, and the problem was there wasn't an imminent reason for a war with Mexico, so Polk created a border sk skirmish Texas border, the contested Texas border with Mexico, uh, using Zachary Taylor's troops. There was a minor skirmish. The Mexicans were provoked. They fired back. And so Polk, while telling untruths to his Secretary of State and leaders of Congress, Polk went to Congress and said, I need a major war against Mexico in response to this skirmish. What this was actually about was that Polk wanted about nearly a million square miles of Mexican territory to be added to the United States so that we could become a continental nation from Atlantic to Pacific. Wonderful aim, but he should have told the truth about it. Right. Right. And also the not so wonderful part of it is that he, want, he wanted most or all this to be slave territory. Right. He was a slaveholder. But the point is that what it did was, you know, it gave Polk the incentive uh, to go to Congress and do this, and that licensed others. You know, that led to William McKinley, the sinking of the Maine. Right. Uh, and the Maine was sunk by. Uh, it would be nice to think that it was Spain, but it was actually a boiler accident. Yeah. But you can't go to war against boilers, so he went to war <laughs> against Spain. And so the point is that, you know, there is a history of this that you know, Congress should be a little bit more firm in resisting. You, you start, as you mentioned, with the War of 1812, and you write, as the War of 1812 receded into history, it would have been healthier had Americans viewed it as a cautionary tale, right. which should have made them skeptical, skeptical of future presidents who called them to battle. We did not heed that tale. Why? That's it, because what was the most unpopular war in our history? It was not Vietnam, it was the War of 1812. New England almost seceded over it. Almost half the con uh, Congress was against it at the beginning. Right. It was a war that was waged not for 
our immediate defense, which is what the founders had told us we had to do, but it had two big war aims. One was stop the British from bothering our ships. The other was conquer Canada. Anyone been to Canada lately? <laughs> uh, I think it's still independent, at least last I checked. Uh, so we didn't even fulfill our war aims. And so since we didn't, guess who was the first president to lose the war? A, a war it was not Richard Nixon, it was James Madison. But because Madison was able to spin 1812 into a victory because of these wonderful scenes, you know, don't give up the ship and Andrew Jackson at New Orleans and the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, I'm a part of this. Uh, cover of my book has the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, there it is, it's hard to see, but you see some flame here. That's the rocket's red glare there. Uh, so I, I'm helping with this myth too. I mean, that was a victory, but people think that because of all this that 1812 was a glorious moment. As it was, it was a, a defeat, wildly unpopular. And the problem is that when we do not remember moments in our history that should be cautionary tales, where things did not go so well, we repeat the same mistakes. And one of those who thought that 1812 was one of the biggest moments in our history was James Polk. I, I was surprised at the portrait that you render of James Madison, our, the, the, the father of our, our Constitution. Talk about him as a commander in chief. Uh, the short version is great founder, bad war president. Uh, everyone can go off to dinner now. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, wonderful scholar, but an extremely weak man. And he was pushed to go to war against England, mm. and he did not have the strength to, to resist it. And he also, liked being a war president. He had this little bicorn hat with a feather, and he had a gleaming silver sword at his side. There are a lot of presidents who want to go to war because they think it will enhance their image. Right. Not a very good thing. Right. Right. The, the, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about several of the, the people that you cover in this book, but the one who is indisputably great is Abraham Lincoln. And you write of Lincoln to wage the most momentous war that Americans had ever fought under any chief executive. Abraham Lincoln had made himself by far the most powerful president that the people of the Union had ever seen. Convinced that the entire democratic venture was in danger, he grabbed for himself unprecedented authority that made him look like a despot. But the crucial fact is that he did so within the democratic process, and Congress and courts, for the most part, affirmed him. Yeah, all true. Uh, and nor did he show a lust for power. This was someone who never did this because he wanted to be a powerful figure. And he suspended habeas corpus. He declared martial law. He did other things that in any other circumstance we would find horrible, but he felt that the union was in danger and if it took those things to do it, you know, he, he would do them and wait for the courts to rule one way or the other. And the same thing with the Congress and may have been necessary to save the Union. Lincoln always said, you know, when I did martial law or when I did habeas corpus, I did not intend this to be a precedent for later presidents, right. but that's a problem because they always take it as a precedent. Sure. And example of that, uh, if you read the memoirs of Richard Nixon, he's talking about some of his excesses during the Vietnam War, violations of civil liberties, and he literally goes on to write, Lincoln was a war president, I was a war president. And so, you know, when a president does something like this, even Lincoln, you have to always keep in mind that you may be opening the way for abuses of power later on. He, he changes and he grows in office. Yes. Um, what are the inflection points of his presidency? The main thing is when Lincoln became president, you know, he was trying to keep the border states where they should be. And he was trying not to inflame people who did not have his own feelings about slavery. So he talked about the reason for the Civil War almost in legal terms. I was sworn to defend the Constitution, and this is, a, this is an illegal you know, uh, insurrection against the Union that I have to correct. And it wasn't working, and even he knew that it wasn't. So after about a year and a half, it's like the moment in The Wizard of Oz that goes from black and white to color. 
Lincoln starts really saying what's in his heart. And he sort of you know, junks all this stuff. And he says, this is really a war against the evil of slavery. And once he begins to talk about the Civil War in moral terms, not only is it a release for him and he becomes a more effective leader, but also the war effort by the North takes on the texture of a crusade. Mm -hmm. So actually, it was a war measure that turned out to be the right thing to do, help to win the war. Was there a catalyst in, in him uh, bowing to his, his moral instincts? Yeah, it was that the legalistic approach was not working, uh, that by then he had the luxury of being able to talk about morality. But also he realized, he once said, I'm gonna go down in history not as the leader of a successful army, but as the liberator of a race. And that was in him. In, 19, in 1864, he was told he was gonna lose the election unless he canceled the Emancipation Proclamation which he thought of doing because he, he wanted to win. And uh, finally decided to stick with it. But Lincoln had the quality that, alas, George H.W. Bush did not have. Lincoln was able to explain unpopular decisions. So mm. he said to Northern Americans, you may worry about the emancipation, maybe it's, you think it's extending the war, but when I declared it, about 100,000 African Americans came from the south to the north. They're working hard in our Union war effort. If I canceled it, they might go back or they might st stop working and we would lose. That's the quality he had helped us to win the war. And, and just as he's battling the Confederate states, he's also battling his own demons. You write, Lincoln's strength amid his own trial by fire was all the more admirable in light of his tendency toward depression. Talk about how that came to bear, Michael, in his presidency. He suffered deeply from depression, and if you have a disposition toward depression, what do you think the effect is of, of making decisions that kill hundreds of thousands of young men? Uh, and that was with him every day of his presidency during the war, and one of the most poignant thing is, things is the last day of his life, he and Mary go for a carriage ride, and he says to her, the war is over, we now have to be happier. And that evening he was assassinated. What, Lincoln is, is so storied. What is the greatest misconception that we have of him? Uh, that this was not a politician, that this was some holy figure. Right. Uh, and I come from Illinois. Uh, so I'm, this is my homeboy, so I'm, uh, in fact, I, I've told the story before, but I got into this line of work because I was taken to the Lincoln sites in Springfield when I was about seven and shown where Lincoln read to his children. And I asked the guide when Lincoln's children misbehaved, did he spank them? And he said, no, Lincoln didn't believe, believe in discipline. Let those brats run wild through this house. And at that moment, Link, Lincoln became my man. I began <laughs> reading about Lincoln and other presidents. And literally, that, that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> So I've got an investment in Lincoln. <laughs> but the reason he was a great president was because he understood the system, he understood politics, and more than anything else, he understood history. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Truman once said, I can't understand how anyone could be president without being interested in history. He, he once said, he said that, not every reader will be a leader, but every leader must be a reader. Um, and in, in Truman's case, and it was also true of Lincoln, uh, Truman said, you know, I had to make all these tough decisions, firing MacArthur and using atomic weapons in Japan and so on. And the book that influenced him more than any other was a book that he had read as a young man, had the horrible title, published, I think, 1895, was called Great Men and Famous Women. The premise that women had no hope of being great, only famous. And <laughs> subtitle title was From Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt. So <laughs> covered this wide swath of human experience. <laughs> but the point is that he felt that that was an indispensable element of his leadership. The same thing with Lincoln. Lincoln had maybe a year and a half of formal education and even that is a generous estimate, so that when he became president and had to be an active commander in chief, 
he sent to the Library of Congress for books on military history and read them. The, the, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to Woodrow Wilson for a moment. And just as I was surprised at the portrait of James Madison, I was a little surprised by the portrait of Woodrow Wilson. Are there any Wilson descendants in the hall? <laughs> uh, this is for my own protection. <laughs> uh, any members of the Wilson Anti-Defamation League? Uh, <laughs> I think we're cool. Go ahead. There's, this, there's one delicious anecdote in the book that I had never read before. But after King George uh, met Woodrow Wilson at Buckingham Palace, he tells an aide, I could not bear him. An entirely cold, academical professor. An odious man. Uh, was, was that me saying that, or was that the king? I, I, I was going to that. say, your yeah. portrait of Wilson is not much different than that I, of King I, George's. I, I do not warm up much to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, number one, he was a rank racist, uh, and he was not a man of his time. His predecessors, Taft and T.R., and Harding, his successor, were much more progressive on civil rights and race relations and the role of the right of every American to have equal opportunity. Uh, and that's something that I'm amazed that Wilson's reputation has survived as long as it, it has, right. with that being a central fe feature of his leadership. Love his progressive reforms during the first term. Uh, to my mind, fairly dreadful war president. A uh, couple of reasons. One is he did very little to explain to Americans why they were at war in Europe. I mean, you know, if you have Woodrow Wilson, there are a lot of things you're not getting. At least you think you're going to be getting eloquent speeches. He spent most of that time holed up in the White House. Right. Right. 1916 was reelected on the basis of a lie. What was his reelection slogan in 1916? Anyone? He kept, kept us, out, us of out of war. Exactly. Well, he knew privately that if he was reelected, he was going to be taking us into a war in about three days. Nonetheless, this academic who had written for decades about the importance of honesty and integrity in public life is perfectly happy to use a lie to get reelected. And it's even worse because 1916, Wilson was barely reelected by the votes of California, and more specifically by the votes of women in California. Women could vote in California in 1916. And they did surveys of the women. Why were they for Wilson? Well, we love Wilson because his slogan tells us that he will keep us out of war, and we love peace. So these idealistic women voters gave Woodrow Wilson his second term on the basis of a lie. So there's an element of hypocrisy there that I find hard to live with. And the other thing is that you have to rate a president in terms of results. And we lost 116,000 Americans in World War I, ferocious casualty rate, more than the Civil War. Uh, but at the end of our involvement in World War I, after the victory, which was 100 years ago last month, Wilson said the reason for this is to make the world safe for democracy, and we'll do it with a world organization called the League of Nations, and the United States will be the cornerstone, at which point he went off to Europe for about six months. So just in terms of political malpractice, if you're at the end of a war and you want Americans, and particularly the Senate, to accept the League of Nations, and there's justifiable worry about the fact that if we join this world organization, maybe we will lose control over our own armed forces. You know, the League of Nations will make those decisions. The president should be there at the front of the debate saying this is why it's a good thing for the country. Instead, Wilson was so self-obsessed. Uh, a friend who was a Wilson scholar read my book in manuscript, uh, and one of his comments on the margin was, would you at least mind taking out the words conceited and messianic? Uh, so <laughs> you, you see which way I'm going. Uh, <laughs> He thought only he could negotiate at Paris, that no one else was up to his brilliant skills. And so he's in Paris for six months, primitive communications. Instead, the debate over the League of Nations is overwhelmed by its enemies, beginning with Henry Cabot Lodge, so that by the time Wilson got back, 
no American involvement in the League of Nations, which leads to the rise of World War II, uh, a settlement that leads to the rise of Adolf Hitler, and then finally, in the late 1930s, when FDR was trying desperately to get Americans to rearm so that if we had to get involved in a war against Hitler and the Japanese, we would be prepared. Get, guess what was his biggest obstacle? Woodrow Wilson. People say, we're afraid that you're another Wilson who's going to drag us into another war where over 100,000 Americans are going to die for nothing, mm -hmm. a war that didn't achieve what Wilson promised. We're only lucky that Roosevelt was able, able to overcome the legacy of Woodrow Wilson and re rearm in the nick of time. So, no, I'm not a huge fan of Woodrow Wilson, and I apologize to any family members who were here. Talk about his, he suffers a, stro uh, a stroke. Talk about those very dark days in the White House where his wife has to take up the mantle of the presidency of the United States. She did, and she was a strong woman, and we are mainly lucky that she did. But one reason that she did was that Wilson, who was conscious and basically alert, was so unwilling to share power that when his Secretary of State and Vice President dared to confine the cabinet in the absence of the great man who was lying in bed upstairs, he fired the Secretary of State. Couldn't fire his Vice President, would have done that too. But the point is that there was a monumental egoism here that I think flawed him as a war president. Yeah. Let me move on to, uh, to Franklin Roosevelt, who gets a, a significantly better rating from Michael Beschloss. Uh, uh, this is a passage. Op opposite end of the scale. <laughs> this is a passage from the book. The 32nd president deserves the verdict of the New York Times rendered the morning after his death that, quote, men will thank God on their knees 100 years from now that Franklin D. Roosevelt was in the White House, unquote. <coughs> it is difficult to imagine any other American leader of that generation guiding with such success a resistant nation toward intervention and ultimate victory in this most momentous of all history's wars, as well as taking Americans into a post-war assembly that would strive to enforce the peace. Why was Franklin Roosevelt such an effective commander in chief? Well, one reason was because he had almost seen it all before. Because Roosevelt was Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy. So he watched Wilson very closely, watched his mistakes. And in case there were mistakes that FDR, young FDR did not notice, FDR was in constant touch with his distant cousin his wife's uncle, Theodore Roosevelt, who was still alive, hated Wilson, and basically all the time was whispering it into FDR's ear, he's doing this wrong, he's doing that wrong, when you're President Franklin, don't do it this way. So the result was that when, when World War II began in 1939, Roosevelt meets with his cabinet, and I quote from this in the book, he says, I have this strange feeling as if I've been through it all before, and he really had. Mm. So that really helped. The other thing that, that Roosevelt was always aware of, and this is a theme of the book, is that in America, any president, but particularly a president of war, has to be a moral leader. You know, Lincoln was a great Civil War president because that was a moral cause. And FDR understood the same thing. And just in case he didn't remember that, guess what book he was reading in 1940? Just pure luck. He was reading Carl Sandburg's uh, account of Abraham Lincoln right. during the Civil War, right. which made the point that if you're running a war, you'd better be a war leader. Don't know how much Roosevelt was influenced by that, but beginning of 1941, Roosevelt gives his State of the Union. And what is he talking about? He's saying that at the end of the war that is now happening, we must fight for the four freedoms, you know, a moral cause. What keeps him going? Uh, this is a president who sees us through the Great Depression, the worst economic disaster in our history, and that goes headlong into the most momentous war in our history. So what, what keeps Franklin Roosevelt going during those very dark times? Uh, he was a leader. 
and he was perfectly suited for that kind. The time was perfectly suited for, the, for his kind of activist leadership. I often think, uh, what if Roosevelt had been present during the 1920s, a time when Americans didn't want a strong president, they didn't want a strong foreign policy around the world, they didn't want a strong government getting involved in the private economy, you know, Roosevelt would have been fr so frustrated, he probably would have gotten into a fight with Congress that might have been so enormous that it might have led to a constitutional confrontation. You know, there is something to the idea that the leader has to sort of fit the time, and this is someone who was basically sort of uh, built for crisis, mm -hmm. and he had two of the greatest crises, of course, in American history, depression and global war. I want to go back to something that you talked about earlier, which is the, uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. One of the two big flaws in his war leadership, the other being, in my view, I think that Roosevelt could have done more to thwart the Holocaust. So talk, talk about both. Let's, let's start with the incarceration. And, and, and I was fascinated because I, I didn't realize. I, I want to, you mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt's objection this policy, and you write, Eleanor Roosevelt was shocked by her husband's decision. Just before Pearl Harbor, she had assured Americans by radio that no law-abiding aliens of any nationality would be discriminated against by the government. You write then, when the president decided to exile Japanese Americans, she was caught by surprise, and she was appalled. So you have this great moral figure and he, he makes this decision, why? Why did he make the decision to intern Japanese Americans? If, if, if Roosevelt were here, I don't agree with this argument, but this is the argument he would make. He, he said, you know, he would say he had to operate assuming the worst case. And the worst case, even it was only rumor, was that there might be agents among Japanese Americans. And so he would say he took the most extreme position possible. I believe that there were people at the time who felt strongly about civil liberties, who realized that you know, that was a bridge too far, that was too much, you're giving up too much of what America should be, even if there are people saying that this will be more of a defense against possible internal enemies. And by the laws of history, it was a, a horrible mistake, and it was, a, it was an atrocity for him to have done that, a blot on his war leadership. And the same, I wrote a, a, another book on this called The Conquerors about 15 mm -hmm. years ago about the fact that I felt that Roosevelt could have done more about the Holocaust, learned about it much earlier in World War II um, than was thought to be at the time, could have spoken against it, and particularly in 1944 could have done things like bombing the rail lines and the camps, which Winston Churchill was in favor of. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at, at this in terms of moral leadership, the most important thing to know is that FDR got the United States involved in World War II and helped to win. Mm -hmm. That's a huge moral statement, but these, these are things that could have made him a better war leader and moral leader. We, we, we sit in the, uh, in the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library. Talk about what is your assessment of Lyndon Johnson uh, as a commander in chief in the Vietnam War? Well, I think I'd start, uh, the Wall, I think it was the Wall Street Journal uh, wrote about my book saying that I, I write about LBJ with a frustrated sympathy. And I think that about does it. Uh, sympathy for the situation that he was in, mm -hmm. which is I mean, almost unbelievable for any commander in chief. And you listen to LBJ on the tapes, a uh, couple of moments, one is, Spring of 1964, uh, he, he says, for instance, you know, what does Vietnam mean to me? What, it is, what does it mean to this country? Uh, people in this country don't even know where it is. You know, why are people calling on me to make that kind of commitment? And he's talking to the great Richard Russell, the senator from Georgia, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Mr. Defense, uh, his mentor, in the Senate and otherwise. And Russell says to LBJ, spring of 1964, I think you ought to get out of there. If you get involved in this war in Vietnam deeply, this is my language, it's not verbatim, he says it'll take 10 years, it'll kill 50,000 Americans, and we will not win. It's gonna be like Korea. 
And I heard that at the time when I was listening to that for the first time and made me wish that I could go back through time and say, listen to your mentor. He's got it right. You know, he's really predicting what might happen. Uh, it was something he felt he could not do. Mm -hmm. So that's one moment. Another is August of 1964, the time of the Gulf of Tonkin. Right. Again, you know, you look at history, it has so much to do sometimes, the accident of the calendar. That was the month that he was, first month he was running for a full month against Barry Goldwater, right. who was charging him with being too soft in foreign policy, particularly on Vietnam. So he's called by Robert McNamara, who says there's a report of an attack on American ship in the Gulf of Tonkin, and he feels compelled to respond with an attack on the North and ask Congress for a Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which both he and Richard Nixon use to wage the Vietnam War for the next nine years. And then 1965, you know, your LBJ, and one thing I love about the new version of the museum in this library is it's so oriented toward the difficult decisions that he had to make. In the history of the presidency, I can't think of a more difficult one than the one I'm about to describe. You're LBJ, it's the beginning of 1965. You've got this unbelievably large majority in the House and the Senate as a result of the landslide of 1964. And you, LBJ, think that you've got about six months to pa pass things like Medicare, voting rights, aid to education, you know, the whole corner, you know, all the foundation stones of the great society. He felt that he had about six months to pass these that the Congress right. after that would get rebellious and tired. So just at the beginning of these six months, in January of 1965, as fate would have it, he has to decide, do you escalate in Vietnam or do you not? From his point of view, if you do not escalate in Vietnam, you're gonna be torn apart by the Republican Party who's gonna say that you were soft on communism and this weakness which discredits you as a leader, voters should also think that it discredits these other crazy programs of yours like Medicare and education, voting rights, and so on. Right. So he was in a, an extreme vice. The other thing he had was he had a Secretary of Defense who, like Woodrow Wilson, is not my favorite, Robert McNamara, uh, who, again, it's one of the misfortunes in American history. I believe that McNamara was his Secretary of Defense at the beginning of 1965. Mm -hmm. One thing that John Connolly recommended to LBJ that he do that LBJ did not take his advice and always regretted it was John Connolly, you know, his great, I'd say Larry, on and off friend, but maybe on, mostly on, wouldn't you say? And confident, they loved each other for decades. Fought, but mainly loved each other. Like a little brother almost. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or almost like two scorpions sometimes. <laughs> uh, not, not, that, not that either of them ever had scorpion-like qualities. Uh, but the thing is that Connolly in 1964 said to LBJ, gracious thing that you did keeping on the Kennedy staff and cabinet, you had to do it after the assassination, but after you're reelected with a landslide, it's now the Johnson presidency. You should fire them all and you should hire people who are loyal unquestionably uh, unquestionably to you, LBJ did not do it. Uh, and he told a number of people I've talked to at the end of his life, it's one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. So at the beginning of 1965, it's on these tapes, McNamara is telling LBJ, LBJ had enormous, I believe unwarranted, but un enormous respect for McNamara, who was saying, you must go deeply into Vietnam. I was President Kennedy's defense secretary. He would have. Right. You don't do this, you're gonna be betraying the Kennedy legacy. Also with a subtle threat that if he does not escalate, guess who's gonna be running around quietly telling everyone that LBJ is letting JFK down, which is not something you'd wanna do a year after the assassination. Right. 
and plus there's a CETO treaty and so forth. So he's getting, to my mind, bad advice. Which is, which is wildly ironic because Robert McNamara stood on this, this very stage and said that John F. Kennedy would have waged the war differently. Uh, this is why I am the opposite of a Robert McNamara fan. Uh, He's in the Woodrow Wilson category? The, is that the, yeah, I, I guess on my, my uh, dislike-o-meter, I think McNamara and Wilson would be both right up there. Uh, and the other thing, all right, I wouldn't have gone on as long as you're opening the door to this. Uh, anyone read McNamara's book uh, in which he makes that statement? You know, JFK by then is the dove who never would have escalated in Vietnam. Problem with McNamara is that he didn't realize that when he published that book that LBJ had taped so many of their conversations in private <laughs> And so the result is you listen to McNamara talking to Johnson. He's saying you have to escalate and get in. One of the reasons why the brilliant Lyndon Baines Johnson taped his conversations was because he was afraid that people with whom he dealt would later on claim that they gave him different advice from the ad advice that they mm -hmm. gave him. Mm -hmm. So thank God for that. And you can see what McNamara's role was here. Another thing he said when that book came out was, we were all to blame for Vietnam. Well, you know, I was seven years old. I was not to blame. Uh, when I was brought up by my parents, they told me to take personal responsibility for my decisions. I think he got different advice, perhaps, in his household. So in any case, I'm trying to reconstruct the situation that LBJ was in. And so LBJ, who is this deeply sensitive human being, who had been director of the National Youth Administration in 1935 here in Texas. That's what he loved. He loved young people. Right. Suddenly, right. he's been turned into their executioner. Right. And if you ask me why LBJ was so tortured by the experience of being a war leader, as Lady Bird described to me, I would say one reason is the number of young Americans he was putting in harm's way but even more than that, the fact that he knew what had led to this, and he knew that from the beginning, and we know this from the tapes, that it was very likely a war that could never be won. So if you ask me why he was suffering, and this only speaks well for him, he was suffering because there were so many boys dying, but he was suffering even more because he knew that they were dying in a cause that would be very hard to win. But, but, but why does he stay the course? Uh, there's thunderous pressure for him to get out, and there's great speculation about why he stays in. Why, in your view, does he uh, pursue this? I think two reasons. Uh, I think he began to personalize it as you get to 66 and 67. The people in the Senate who were attacking him, it was almost, you know, I'm just going to show them that we're going to pull this through and, and win. But the other thing, it was Robert McNamara's doctrine of graduated response, which was... You begin with a small force. If that doesn't work, you escalate it. and You keep on pressure on the North Vietnamese. And at some point, mathematically, you'll reach the point where the North, where the North Vietnamese cave. Uh, McNamara did not realize that mathematics don't necessarily explain the Vietnamese people who for centuries had been expert at you know, defying conquerors who tried to take over their country. But the one lovely story is one that when my book came out, it was on the front page of the Sunday New York Times, largely thank, thanks to two people. One is our friend Larry Temple, who advised me. I think we can give Larry another hand for that. <laughs> because it, it really does remind us of the great side of LBJ as a war leader. And the other was all of our friend Tom Johnson, who was uh, also a young, close aide to LBJ in 1968. And what the story was is we found the final sort of pieces of this. It had been known that William Westmoreland, the commander in Vietnam, was thinking of asking for nucle tactical nuclear weapons, which he writes about in his memoirs. Uh, over later years, more and more documents came open including ones in the Johnson Library that we talked about a couple years ago. Right. 
But if you look at the documents, as is often the case, they don't tell the full story because what the documents show is that Westmoreland in 1968 asked for the possibility of considering moving nuclear weapons to South Vietnam and using them, if necessary, to avert defeat. And another document comes back from Washington saying, no, don't do that. Uh, fine. What we didn't have was the involvement of the president here. And there's a reason for that. LBJ did not want it known that he was the one turning this down. It was an election year. He didn't want Republicans on the Hill saying, LBJ is turning down the advice of his commanders who want to win in Vietnam. What's wrong with him? So the only person who could supply a firsthand recollection of LBJ's role in this was Tom Johnson, who spoke with me and st spoke with David Sanger, who was writing this piece for the Sunday New York Times about this. And so it becomes not a story of cables going back and forth in a bureaucracy, but the role of what a president did. And what LBJ did, according to Tom, totally in character, says, I won't quote the profanity that LBJ used in response to this idea of using nuclear weapons in Vietnam, but he basically said, you know, I've been spending four years trying to keep this war from becoming nuclear. I wanted to keep Russia and China out. You know, if we bring in nuclear weapons, that's going to become a, a war with Russia and China who also have nuclear weapons. This could wind up killing 100 million people. I feel strongly about what's in stake in Vietnam, but not to the point of risking the lives of 100 million people and incinerating the hemisphere. And so the result was that we avoided that fate. And so two things. Number one, we oftentimes hear people saying, you know, why don't we leave, leave war to the generals? That's why we don't. Uh, nothing wrong with Westmoreland. I mean, his job as commander was to win the Vietnam War, if possible, within the framework of the assignment and the means that he had been given. But the job of the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, was, yes, if possible, win the war in Vietnam, but also make sure that you don't kill 100 million people. And that is why it is crucial that we always have in America a president of wisdom and judgment and experience and a sense of history, always. And, and as we want... <laughs> To that end, in the, in the book's epilogue, you write, the founders hoped that all future presidents would be people of sagacity, self-restraint, honesty, experience, character, and profound respect for democratic ideals. As they looked forward in our history, on balance, would they be pleased with the commanders in chief who would, would, would uh, occupy the White House, or would they be disappointed? I think for the most part, they'd be happy with the presidents that we have chosen, most of them. Uh, but one thing that they really worried about, and I think this is something to keep in mind, and you know, I'm not in politics. I mean, I am a registered independent. This is not a, a current events comment. This book I started 10 years ago. It's the same thing I'd be saying, you know, whatever the current situation is. But, one thing always to be aware of and worry about and really sleep with one eye open is that anyone who worries about presidents meddling with our democratic institutions or violating our civil liberties or abusing power, wartime is the time that it really happens. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, my sweetheart, uh, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson passed something called the Espionage Act. And the Espionage mm -hmm. Act was used to go after journalists or anyone else who criticized him. Still in force, presidents can use it today. Yeah. Uh, presidents can declare martial law in wartime. There is a very big temptation for modern presidents to get involved in wars because it gives them more power than they otherwise might have. I mean, if God forbid there's a cyber attack or a Russian missile comes over the North Pole, uh, did anyone, for instance, get on your iPhone a couple weeks ago, a little bit more than that, 
a presidential alert mm -hmm. announcement? It's benign today, but someday we may have a president who uses that and modern communications in ways that are not so benign. Right. So what it comes to is, you know, just to close this, famously in Philadelphia in 1787, Benjamin Franklin was asked, what kind of a system have you given us? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. It's our job always with every president to always keep a vigilant eye on every president to make sure that they do not abuse power in a way that may jeopardize our democracy. And that is one of the jobs of all of us as citizens. It sure is important for us to vote. I come from Chicago. We're urged to vote more than once on election day. So we, <laughs> early we and take off. that early and often. We early take that off. very seriously. But the other thing I come back to is what Franklin also said about that our critic is our friend. Right. Uh, all of us must always criticize, always protest presidents and everyone in office because that's the only way we keep our democracy. It is a testament to... It is a testament to Michael's skill as an author that uh, the book is 750 pages and to my mind it's too short. The New York Times calls anyone it. Anyone who doubts uh, the graciousness of Mark Updegrove. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the New York Times calls Presidents of War a superb and important book, superbly rendered. I want to thank our guest, Michael Beschloss. Thanks very thank much. You. Can thank, I, you. thank you. Can I say one word? Yeah, by all means. Words? Yeah. Thank you. One word from our guest. Sorry. Please. Uh, and if I could say, number one, thank you to all of you for coming when we had to reschedule the evening. All of us really appreciate the fact that you're kind enough to be here uh, since we were not able to do it last, uh, last week. And the other thing is if I could uh, thank my interlocutor, the great Mark Updegrove. Just oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.